This is our bed gown pattern. Now I folded up the edge down there just so that I had a nice straight, flat, stronger bottom edge to deal with. But it also comes with extra pattern pieces. These pattern pieces, however, are specifically for uh, contrast fabrics, but you don't need to do contrast fabrics. This would be for a folded up cuff. Melissa, your, your cuffs are folded up and she didn't use any contrast fabric. She just used the inside of her fabric to show that. This is for the collar. It's usually contrast, but it could be the same fabric or it could be, don't want to do it at all. Now, this is Melissa in the bed gown sample, and you can see, again, it was made for me and not for her. But you wrap it around a little further, you can see the length is different. It doesn't have pleats in the back, so when you wear it with an apron, it would look like that in the back. Now we're going to work on the bed gown. Now I've already determined that I'm going to line it and I'm actually going to make it reversible so that I could use either of these fabrics as the outside fabric. And yes, there's a huge difference in value, but I looked at these two fabrics and said, hmm, looks good to me. So I'm happy with this. Now, just like our pattern when we checked it to make sure it would fit onto our fabric. I have folded this in, in quarters. So this is going to be my hem, the raw edge. My sleeves are gonna come out to the selvage edge here. And this is going to be the back of my neck in here. I've done the same thing on this fabric. Because this is a stripe, I wanna make sure that I have a beautiful stripe going down the center back and so I have pinned that in place and I can actually cut this all at the same time. I don't have to do cut the top and cut the bottom. Hello, so now I've put my two layers of fabric right on top of each other with all the folds matching up. So all of my selvage edges are on that side and my folds are on this side. Now you might notice that my fabric is just a wee bit short for this bed gown pattern. And I don't really mind. It happened that this was the length of fabric I had, and if it's two and a half inches shorter, who cares? No one's gonna be taking me to the police over that. So my next job is to cut this out to make sure that all the important things that need to be marked are marked, and you know how to do that because you watched me do it with the short gown. confused about those folds here we're going to make a sample just to make ourselves feel more at ease this is going to be the hemline these are going to be the sleeve line and if I was to cut out the same shape of my garment remember you have to cut the center front too Now I have my garment cut out. I just realized I made a mistake over here. Now I said that I had folds here and I had folds here. In order for me to get in and out of this garment, I have to have the center front open. So even though it's on a fold now, I'm actually going to open that seam all the way to the hem.
There you go. For the bed jacket, it asks you to make a cuff and a collar. I have my cuff here and my collar here. Now again, I said that you could either do it out of the same fabric, out of contrast fabric, or have none at all. I'm going to do the collar out of this muslin because I think that will be attractive, but I actually might make the sleeve cuff out of the original fabrics so that I have that. But you need to lay it out just in this simple manner. I have enough room to get around this entire piece. Oopsie, I take that back. I look at the pattern. It's always good to look at your pattern. And I see very clearly it says, place this edge on the fold. So I will do that. This edge is on the fold. And that edge is also on the fold. Now I will cut out three sides and I will cut out three sides of this. Alrighty, now Melissa reminded me of something. On this long bed gown, you actually need to put pocket slits in your side seams. And you can see where they go at a comfortable place below your waist so that you can reach in through your pocket slits into your petticoat and into your pockets. So don't forget to leave a pocket slit on each side seam of your lining and your jacket pattern. And I would suggest nine inches. Okay, good so suggestion. So there's room to pull out what's going, what you're pulling out, <laughs> to put in what you're putting in, and you know, with your hand right. wide, I thought so. We, we talked about that on the petticoat pattern. You can go back and look at that in right. relation there. Okay, that's true. All right, ladies. Now you have cuffs and you have a collar. You need to stitch your cuffs onto the end of the sleeves. The collar is made as a separate item. If you are going to line it, it gets put inside that seam that you're going to do all the way around your garment, just like you did with the short gown. Actually, the construction of this is identical to the short gown, with the exception of that collar piece. You'll need to find the center of the collar, the center of the back of the garment, connect them with pins, pin them to the edge of the collar, and then just stitch them in. Well, shall I model a little bit of our finished garment? So here's, now remember I made mine reversible. And I want to point out something else on this pattern, is that it has fairly long sleeves. I have really long arms. If I have a sleeve that fits me that goes over my wrist, it's a long sleeve. So people like my dear friend Terry Brasco, oh baby, you don't need to add extra length onto those sleeves. So be aware how long the sleeve actually is. And I think this is a pretty charming little jacket. I might actually wear it in real life. But I also want to remind you that I did put in the pocket slits on each side. So that can be done very easily. Now this is a sample. I don't really need two sleeves, so I only put in one. Because the information I learn off of one, I can transfer to the other. Now, Obviously, it's not made for Melissa. It was made not even for me. It was made for a friend who's even bigger than I am. So it's quite commodious on her. But even with it being so big, I would quickly say, well, the waistline is off on her. It should be here instead of an inch below. I could quickly say the shoulder and the neck is too big on her and I could take in the neckline, which is on the back of the shoulder, very quickly, so that it fits her a little bit better. And just those two little tweaks have now made this garment, which was incredibly big, 
a little bit more to her size. That's why we make samples, so we can fit them so that they fit crop properly. Now, Melissa was also reminding me that sleeves don't need to be quite this big and baggy. Obviously, it wasn't made for me or her, and should probably be about like this on her. You can see my sleeves fit me well. They're not too tight and not too bulky. Mm -hmm. So now I've taken this pattern off of her. Any of the markings that I had with pins, I would now rough up with a pencil so I could see them. And I would change my pattern pieces so I have pattern pieces that fit her. And again, rather than compromise a pattern that I purchased that might come in handy some other time, I'm going to go to my wrapping paper and make a pattern from the altered sample that I've made. All right, so this underneath one is the one that I have adjusted from the pattern that I cut here. And sadly, I had to add some. Oh, that's the way life is. But also, I want you to realize that I did alter this pattern but kept the information I needed to keep. All of these marks are about those lacing points that happen on these two views of the jacket. So if you're doing view A, you don't need to worry about them at all. If you're doing C, D, or B, you'll need to worry about that. You'll need to transfer those markings onto your new pattern. And also, it doesn't cut in the center front. It cuts off center. And here are your cutting lines that you will also need to transform so that you have that information available. Okay, ladies, we're moving on to this jacket. I have actually pre-fitted and cut my lining for my friend who is making not the view A, but the view B jacket. So it's not quite as big across the front and uh, she's a little bit bigger around than I am. But this beautiful fabric that we talked about on the last part of the video that has the roses growing on it has to be uh, the fabric she has chosen and we need to make sure that the roses grow up on both sides. So I'm going to lay this out as a rough layout, cut off the end of the fabric. Whee! Can I reach? Yes, I can. <laughs> and I will roll out another piece, approximately the same length. We want to make sure that the roses match up to a certain extent. I think this is about where the pattern overlaps. There. No. Pull it up. There you go. Because we want our roses to be in approximately the same place from side to side. If we're a little bit more generous than we need to be, it doesn't hurt a thing. She has plenty of fabric. Okay. I'll cut this one off too. had arms another three inches longer. There we go. Now you might wonder as you look at Melissa measuring the distance between the two edges of the fabric, why do I not have them lined up next to each other? We'll go back to our video on matching in our petticoat video and you'll know why. We need to match the patterns so that they run approximately the same height in each of the pieces. And I have now lined up my fabric so my roses are basically in the exact same place from one side to the other. Now, I want to see where my edge is and I can lay out my patterns now. I might not be able to get all three patterns across as I had in my rough cut because now I have to deal with the matching of the pattern. That's okay, she has plenty of fabric. I don't think it will go to waste. 
make sure that you're not off the edge of the top. Okay. Because it's down it's quite a way, yeah. All righty, so yes indeed, only two of our patterns will fit on. So now we can cut out these patterns and then I'll lay out more fabric and cut that third pattern, which is the side back. This is our front, this is our back, our center back seam, our side back seam, our side seam, our center front. So we need to do the side back piece and the sleeve piece. And I've laid these out exactly how I did the last time with the roses kind of connecting and uh, rough cut it so that I know I'm good to go. Now you'll notice, unlike most of the things that we sew in the 20th century, where you put the sleeve on the straight of the grain, I very carefully laid it out on the cross grain. You see in the marking on your pattern, it goes either way. But quite frankly, in the 18th century, they hardly ever put a sleeve on the straight of the grain. It always went across the grain, making the pattern go around the sleeve instead of up and down on the sleeve. We think it looks odd. They thought it looked normal. So we're going to make it look normal for the 18th century because that's who we are. On my petticoat video, I featured this fabric and taught you how to match along it. And I also said, oh, I can't wait to make a jacket out of it. This is the jacket I'm going to make. So you can see that I carefully matched things so they line up beautifully. But basically here, all I'm gonna say to you is I've sewn my seams. I sewed my center back seam. I sewed my side back seams. I sewed my underarm seam and I also sewed my shoulder seam, which as I said, is cast off to the back side of your shoulder. So I made not only the jacket, I also cut and made the lining. And it's probably easier for you to see those sewn seams on the lining side rather than on the busy side. We're getting ready to think about finishing this jacket. And in order to finish the jacket, I need to add the sleeves and I need to stitch around the edge. So, have I done the sleeves? You betcha, I did the sleeves. All right, ladies, after you've done both your lining and your jacket, those four seams, the side backs, the sun, center back, the side and the shoulder seams, you can put your lining into your jacket. You do that by putting the right side of the fabric against the right side of your lining. You can tell the right side from the wrong side because the wrong side has seams. So it should be pretty easy. You just need to match up where the seams match from here to here and pin all the way around like one big happy circle. Also, remember to leave a gap in the center back where you're going to pull your jacket out from the inside out. On these very curvy necklines, to make a quarter inch seam allowance rather than the full 5 eighths, I also have a very small neck. So that's one of the reasons I tend to make a shallower seam at the neckline. Hi ladies, I'm at the turn inside out point on this jacket. Now both my jackets, all three of my jackets, if you're putting a lining in, this is how you do it. I told you that you make a slit that you can find. <laughs> there it is. You reach in, you grab the outer fabric, and you literally pull it all through that hole. 
Now, you should also take note to clip curves, to clip off corners and things like that. Today, I'm just gonna pull it through really quickly because I need to move on to the next step. I will, at some point, pull it back out and make sure that all that clipping happens. I have one sleeve totally sewn ready to go into my garment and I have another one ready to finish to put into my garment. My best solution to you on how to finish this bottom edge is actually to construct it this way so that you're going to sew the bottom edge first before you sew the side seams and then you're going to sew the side seams in one fell swoop both the outer fabric and the lining fabric at once. Once you've sewn that underarm seam, you can then pull the lining into the outer fabric and iron it very carefully so that you have it lined up nice and flat like this. This is ready to be set into the sleeve of my jacket. All I need to do is make sure the jacket is ready to have it. The first thing you need to do is connect the lining to the outer garment around that sleeve arm side. You can actually baste them together because they're gonna act as one from now on. On the other hand, your sleeve is gonna not act as one. You're gonna work on two parts separately, the outer fabric and the lining fabric. So my first job is to match up my sleeves underneath arm's eye uh, seam. So I'm pinning these matched up seams. Here's my seam here, my seam here, and my seam here. And they're all going to sit absolutely together. Just like that. Then, carefully, I'm going to go pin the rest of my sleeve up toward the top of the sleeve head. The top of the sleeve is called a sleeve head. I'm not going to go all the way to the tippy top though because in the 18th century, they were a lot smarter than some of us are today. My dear friend Melissa called putting in sleeves. They don't even call them sleeves, she said. They call them sleevels, they're evil. And I have to disagree because they don't have to be altogether that evil. Now I'm gonna work on the other side, working up toward the head of that sleeve again. Again, I'm keeping the lining part totally separate at this point. And I'm now approaching my shoulder seam, which is sitting on the back edge of the garment. I've left about, oh, four to five inches of sleeve that I haven't pinned. On the other hand, the head of my sleeve is significantly bigger, more like about seven to eight inches. That fullness is going to eventually be pleated onto here, but not yet. First, I'm going to sew this in, and I suggest you baste first. Basting always makes it easier if there's a mistake made my seam up to that four inch gap and don't forget in sleeves particularly you need to slash they are a very curvy object and if you want them to lie flat you need to slash around your sleeve in order to have enough of an opening to even get your arm through. So Melissa is modeling my far from ironed far from completed jacket but I just wanted to explain to you 
how the top of the sleeve actually works. You can see that I have this big gappity gappity thing here. And what we will do is first of all, bring it onto her shoulder. And in the 18th century, they literally would give you a fitting at this point. So every single sleeve was hand fit onto the person wearing that garment. And from side to side, they are incredibly different because we are not symmetrical. We come with a right side and a left side, <laughs> and they are not the same. <laughs> so the, all these historical, beautiful garments are all individually fit on their original wearers, just the same way as I'm fitting this sleeve onto Melissa. And that's how you do it. That's just that simple. Hi. Here we are again. Can you tell it's a new day? New clothes, new day. I have gotten our jackets to a point where we're dealing with the sleeves. And I wanted to review the fact that on Melissa, it took two pleats to do the top of her sleeve to make it neat. Now it might be three, it might be two. It doesn't matter, it can be very flexible. You just wanna make sure that each sleeve fits you comfortably. Now, let's move to the inside of the jacket. I have put together here, part of the work is already pre-done. We're talking about the sleeve lining going into the lining. And let me show you what I have done to make it look this neat. I have tipped all of the sleeve, sleeve seam allowance in toward the sleeve. I've clipped in order to allow maximum movement. And then I pulled up my sleeve lining, folded over 5 eighths of an inch, which is our seam allowance. Again, I clipped in order to make maximum uh, movability. And we are going to pin the sleeve lining into the sleeve hole, the arm's eye, and it's easy to follow because you can see where your stitching line went for your outer sleeve. Now, just the same way as we left this open on the top, you'll need to leave this open on the top until you fit it on you. So, you're about ready to go. And now we're going to talk about other things that you need to do for the oddball jackets, view B and D. Okay, we're going to deal with those views that are B, C, and D from the jacket with the set sleeves, B, C, and D. Now here's what it involves. It involves lacing and it involves a stomacher. The stomacher is the part that goes underneath. And you can, and it happens that today I'm actually wearing a stomacher with lacing because we're working on this project. Now, the neat thing about a stomacher is you can have more than one. So if I had wanted to, I could have had a brown stomacher in here today and it would have gone perfectly fine. I could have had a beige stomacher that matched my jacket. I could have had any number of different colors if I wanted to highlight a red or an orange. I could always have a different stomacher. So although they're, very, they're not that simple to make, they're very handy because they change your look very quickly and they're not that hard. However, they do involve some different products that you might have maybe never used before. One of them is a very strong tape. Now this happens to be, honest to goodness, boning tape. It has a little hole in here that I can maybe access that you stick the boning inside of. I have to admit, in all of the years that I worked in the theater and I made corsets and all sorts of stuff, we never did that. You know why? Because two layers of this tape is stronger than one layer of this tape. And if we stitch down on each side, 
Rather than use the little tiny casing in here, we use the whole casing to make it stronger. But if you can't find this tape, which is not particularly easy to find, you can use other kinds of tape, but keep that in mind that maybe two layers is better than one. Another product we're going to need is boning material of some sort. Now, I'm sure you didn't expect me to take out a bag of zip ties, but right now, many, many, many historic reenactors are making their stays with zip ties. They're inexpensive, they're very easy to acquire, and they work. If you want to be more faithful, in the 18th century, they didn't have uh, metal bones like this bone, and I have to say my stays are made with metal bones, but they did have instead pieces of reed that they would soak and dry and they would put those into their corsets. Now, honestly, I tight lace. If I did that, I would have a lot of broken reeds. Having metal inside mine, I don't need to worry about that. Nonetheless, this is what we're going to be needing. So I suggest you run out to Home Depot or Lowe's and get some zip ties. So right now what I'm doing is I'm flat lining the lining or the interfacing to my lining. And flat lining is not a pretty thing, but it works really well. It just basically means go around the whole exterior outside edge so that they become one piece of fabric. So now I am putting my boning tape into place. And you'll notice that I've given extra amount at the top of each one of these because they're going to have to fold over in order to make a safe casing. And I have pinned them down. I will be stitching on each side as close as I can to the edge. Oopsie. But I want to make sure that you're aware that the bottom doesn't matter much. Oopsie, don't cut the pin. Not good for your scissors. Um, the top, I'm going to want to fold down and put in place well away from the seam line. So that's not enough yet. I want to make sure that that is absolutely not going to be caught in my seam once I turn my stomacher right side out because this will be clean finished along with the outer fabric. So that's about the distance I'm going to make sure that I'm away from that top edge with all of these. Stitch to the right width.
So I have now stitched, leaving an opening from here to here. Now that's a fairly big opening. Even when I stitched the jackets, I left a smaller opening, more like this. The reason I leave, left this one so big is because we've add, added stiffener and this heavy boning tape. And I know that it's going to be hard to manipulate to get it through a small opening. So I left it larger just to allow manipulation. I'm actually going to do one more line of stitching at the base of each of these bone casings because with time and with gravity, that bone will force its way out. So you might as well give a little bit of extra oomph there. Before I turn it, I'm actually going to iron my seams open. This means that I'll end up with a sharper edge when I'm uh, ready to turn it. So it's not a bad idea to sometimes just pre-iron a place that you know you're going to do a hard iron on when it's finished. Doesn't hurt anything to, uh... oh, that's where my opening is. <laughs> opening is. I'm just going to maybe do the other side too. Doesn't hurt to prep just a little bit. Now I'm a little concerned about this bottom edge because I have white tape and the brown that white tape might show. If I was a professional, I would have had black tape. I don't have black tape, I've got white. So if that edge does actually show in the long run, I can just take a magic marker and mark over that on the inside or on the outside when I get there. And, you know, a little bit of brown on that white tape and it looks brown. You 
can see what I mean about that edge here. If I want to make that more invisible, I can put brown marker on the white. All right, so now I just need to do a hard press and turn out my corners better than this, which I want nice sharp corners, not just foldy over corners. But for right now, because I have other things to do with you, all I'm going to say is remember you can put your stays in now this way. You can color those edges so that they don't show. And that would mean you'd have a finished stomacher. So we have our thread ready to go, but first we have to push the hole through the fabric. And I have a number of different awls here. This one is literally uh, from Home Depot. This one is a very lovely, very sharp and pointy one, which I'm going to start with. This one's an antique, and all three of these work really well, and I might actually use all three of them on this right now. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take my very pointy one and put this right on my, my dot and force it through so that I've now punctured a hole through all of the layers of my fabric. I'm gonna take my one from Home Depot and make that hole bigger by twisting it. And I know it doesn't look like very ladylike sewing, but this is what is necessary to make that the fibers separate from that hole so that we can get an eyelet big enough to put ribbon through. And you'll see, I now have a nice big opening. And the reason I like this one, it's easier to carry in most situations, so if I'm hand sewing somewhere else, it does the same kind of job that this guy does, it just doesn't do the pointy part as well. So I like these two in conjunction when I'm working away from home, but boy, when I'm at home, this is a really good tool. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start by putting my thread so that my knot gets buried in between the layers of my jacket. So my very first stitch is going through the hole in between the layers and burying that knot inside where I'll be stitching. From now on, I'm just going to go in the hole. I'm not going through any fabric at all, just going through the hole and I'm gonna go right next to my last stitch at about, oh, 3 16ths of an inch. Yes, I do know what 3 16ths of an inch looks like. I'm wrapping my thread over my needle so that it's interlocked, and then I'm going to go through the hole at a distance of the hole at 3 16ths, right next to my last stitch, thread over the knot, or over the needle rather, and I'm going to do that the entire way around my eyelet. You don't want your stitches too close to each other because if they overlap a little too much they get bumpy. So you do want them to be separate from each other. I've gone about an eighth of the way around my circle so far. Oopsie, didn't wrap around. There we go. So you do that all the way around until you come to the last stitch. And in the last stitch, you're going to actually interlock through the very first stitch that you did 
so that you have a full circuit of interlocking stitches. Ladies, it's been a pleasure to take you through these three different jacket patterns. And if you get confused, remember there's always some help. First of all, your patterns came with special instructions. Second, you can go online to other videos. And third, don't forget our online blog site at njdarsos250.wordpress.com. I hope to see these finished jackets in the near future, and I'm sure they're all going to be wonderful. It's been so much fun, and have a great time sewing. Bye now.